I will be starting in-person classes here in Asheville, North Carolina soon. If you would like to join and attend an in-person class here in Asheville, North Carolina, please click on the Silicon Dojo meetup link down below. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's class, we are going to be talking about how computers find each other on a network, and then the basics of how they actually go through the communication process. Now, one of the things with this particular class is you are going to have to know things I have not taught you yet in order to fully grasp this class. And if you're sitting there going, what? Yeah, well... Sucks to be a noob. Sucks to be a noob. Again, one of the things that I have talked about uh, in this uh, the series of networking classes is unfortunately there are so many topics that many times in order to understand one topic, you have to understand a different topic. But to learn about that different topic, you have to know this topic first and you get in this whole weird chicken and egg thing and a lot of people decide to just go off and have a beer instead. But if you, if you stick with me, I will try to guide you through this process. If at the end of this class you are still confused, just, just understand that's completely normal. It will be normal to be confused at the end of this class. Take the information that you've learned from this class, follow on with the other classes in the series, and then if you still don't quite understand everything going on, you can come back to this class and a lot of things will make a lot more sense, right? Because today we're going to be talking about things such as address resolution, so uh, resolving IP addresses to MAC addresses, uh, resolving fully qualified domain names to IP addresses, and I haven't taught you a darn thing about IP addresses yet. And that's one of the problems that we get into, again, as we start talking about these types of topics, is that there's so much going on, you know, we have to talk about one thing before we actually get to that thing. But again, it should not be uh, too difficult for you. So what we're going to be talking about today is essentially when computers are trying to communicate with each other on a network or on different networks, we're going to talk about how they actually find each other. And then once uh, they've actually found each other, how the communication actually begins. And so this can give you a better idea of how your computers, how your systems uh, are communicating and it can be very useful for for troubleshooting processes uh, many times people have this idea that network communication is kind of sort of like magic right you connect these computers together little lights blink and they talk but that's not really how it works. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. As I talked about before, we have things like collision domains. When we talk about Ethernet technology. We have IP addresses. We have MAC address resolution. We have all of these different processes going on. Uh, and if anything gets screwed up with any of these uh, individual components in the technology, you can have major problems on your network. You can also get results uh, that you don't necessarily understand why you're getting the results you're getting. Uh, one of the things we talk about is things like speed, right? Speed and latency uh, for data going across a network. Well, a lot of times, again, you look and you see what your bandwidth is and you see the, the size of the file that you're trying to move. And many times you don't understand what, why does it seem so slow? It seems like the, the file, moving the file is slower than it should be. And one of the right reasons might be things like overhead. One of the things we're going to talk about today are, are packets and frames. Uh, so in, whenever you have a file and you're trying to move it over the network, you have to subdivide that file into small little bits. And then each one of those small little bits have to have things called headers. And these headers have the, the MAC address we'll talk about, the IP address, a whole bunch of other information, and all of that gets sent. So not only do you have to send the data itself, but the data has to get broken up. Once the data is broken up, it has to have headers uh, put onto it. It then has to get shipped over the network. Uh, all of those different packets and frames and packets have to get put back together. Um, and so there's a lot more to this process. And so the reason that you may have have issues is for, for things other than what you might be thinking. So anyways, with that, let's dive into this class. So the first thing that we need to talk about in this class is how we identify our computers, our systems, any kind of network type devices that we're going to be interacting with. Uh, so this could be your host computer, this could be a printer, this could be a server, basically anything that is connected to the network. And you have to realize that the way you may identify the computer is not the same way that the computers will identify each other. We actually have multiple 
multiple different ways of identifying a computer or a device. And then we have basically resolution protocols uh, that turn what we're trying to use into something uh, that the computer can use. Uh, so the, the man in the middle, basically the, uh, the, the way that you normally think uh, about identifying computers nowadays is something called an IP address. So now when we talk about this class today, I'm going to be talking a lot about TCP IP4. Uh, so when we talk about networking, uh, supposedly when you do networking classes, you should be theoretically protocol agnostic. As we talked about before, Ethernet is a networking technology uh, that basically has standards for what cable should be used, Cat5, Cat6 cable, uh, how the cables should connect to computers, uh, power consumption, all of that kind of stuff. But Ethernet is not the protocol. The protocol is something separate than at the Ethernet technology. Now, a protocol that you're probably used to hearing is TCP IP version 4. You may have also heard of TCP IP version 6, but frankly, there's a whole bunch of other protocols out there that can use the Ethernet uh, basically networking standard. Uh, back in the days, we had to learn about IPX, SPX, um, Apple Talk, NetBuoy, and a whole bunch of others. Here's the thing, <laughs> here's the thing. We're all going to be using TCP IP version 4, probably until 2032. That's my bet. Basically, we're going to get off of TCP IP version 4 at about the same time. Literally everything is connected to 5G networking. Um, and so basically one of, one of the issues you run into when you're trying to teach networking is you're supposed to be protocol agnostic, but all we use is TCP IP 4. And so you get into this stupid world. So when I talk about this today, this is going to be very heavy on TCP IP4 because that's what actually matters. Again, when we talk about something like an IP address, right? The IP address is how the TCP IP4 protocol identifies computers. It's not the same as the MAC address. The Ethernet technology standard uses something called a MAC address, a media access control address that is hard coded, more or less, it is hard coded into every single network card, every single port on your network. And that's how the, the Ethernet technology standard basically identifies uh, all the computers and all of the devices. When you go up to the protocol level, again, we're dealing with uh, TCP IP version 4, TCP IP version 4 uses something called a uh, an IP address. And so that's how you identify things within the, uh, the, the TCP IP protocol. But then we have to resolve down to that MAC address. So I hope that makes a darn bit of sense. <laughs> Anyways, I got to go forward. So anyways, let's say we have a a a, a, a IP address of 192.168.1.10, right? Um, so basically, we're going to try to communicate with this particular IP address. Now, when your computer is on the network and it goes to reach out to this particular IP address, uh, basically, the Ethernet network doesn't really care about the IP address. It cares about what is called the MAC address, that media access control address. That's, a, that's an AP. Uh, digit or eight whatever thing octagon whatever it's called uh, hexadecimal address essentially the first part of it is the identifier for the vendor who manufactured uh, the piece of networking equipment and the final bit of it is essentially a serial number um, and that's how all of the devices are identified on the network and so we have something called ARP and so what ARP is is called address resolution protocol. So what ARP does is it resolves MAC addresses to IP addresses. So when a computer tries to communicate on the network, it's going to say, basically, I'm going to need the MAC address for 192.168.1.10. Once it gets that MAC address, it will then try to send the information or it'll try to communicate with the computer that has that particular MAC address. Now, on the other side of this, right, so we've got this uh, IP address, let's say 192.168.1.10. Normally, most likely, when you're interacting with the network, you're not normally interacting with uh, the IP 
IP addresses, you're normally acting uh, dealing with a basically human readable name, a uh, server or CNN.com or something like that, right? Uh, it's something called a fully qualified domain name, right? Basically, this is just a, a human readable, a human rememberable name, uh, the, the name of your print server, the name of your SharePoint server, the name of your Active Directory server, right? Your Active Directory server, you may literally name it mail server. Well, here's the thing. Again, as this goes, uh, the computer really doesn't care about the name mail server, right? So let's say you have a server that is named mail server, right? What happens is when you plug in mail server, so when you try to connect to it, like you're trying to connect to it, do a, do a file share, you're trying to connect to it in order to, to configure the uh, the email settings or whatever else, uh, with this, you're going to be using something called DNS, or this is gonna happen in the background, domain name services. And so what happens with domain name services is you have a DNS server uh, that's sitting on your network or possibly up on the internet somewhere. When you go to try to connect to mail server, your computer is going to talk to the DNS server and the DNS server is going to say, oh, the IP address for mail server is 192.168.1.10. So now your computer using TCP IP version four knows, okay, I need to communicate with 192.168.1.10. But as said before, on the, the local network, the local network really doesn't care about those IP addresses. What's really important is the MAC address for mail server. And so what's going to happen is your computer is then going to communicate out on the network and say, I need the MAC address uh, for 192.168.1.10. That is configured on that mail server. And so that mail server will respond with its MAC address. This is address resolution protocol. That MAC address will be given back to your computer and then when your computer goes to download emails upload emails whatever else it will then be using this mac address so this is kind of like the basic concept here when we start talking about resolution uh, and this is one of the things that gets very confusing uh, especially when you're new to networking because we have all these different things going on like we have like 50 different ways to identify a computer and then you have to kind of figure out how this resolution process works and then uh, obviously if there's any problems if there's any breaks in the system uh, you may ha have an issue there but so basically what we do here is if you're trying to go to mail server right just mail server your computer will go to the DNS server. It will resolve mail server to an IP address, 192.168.1.10. Once you have that, your computer will communicate on the network and say, hey, 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 I'm looking for 192.168.1.10. Who is it? Basically, one of the, the computer with that IP address on the network will respond with its MAC address. And then once your computer has that MAC address, it will then be able to, to, to find, basically be able to communicate uh, with the server that you're trying to communicate with. Okay, so are you following me so far? No? You're lost already? Don't worry, it's fine. We were all in your shoes at some point. Just, I don't know, rewatch this video a couple of times. Okay, at this point, we basically understand how to do resolution on the local network, right? So I'm trying to communicate with a server on the local network. DNS provides me the IP address for that fully qualified domain name, mail server, or whatever that, that name is. Once I get that address, I then try to communicate on the, out on the network to find out what MAC address I'm supposed to be communicating with. I get back that MAC address, and then we're able to talk. Here's the question though, what happens when you're trying to communicate with a server on an entirely different network? Again, what happens when we're trying to go back to good old CNN.com? I don't know why, I, I, I'm not trying to push CNN.com CNN here, I've just been using that as an example for years at this point. But anyways, let's say you are sitting on your network, right? you got multiple computers connected to your switch, your switch is a layer two device. Again, the, uh, the MAC addresses are very important for the switch. You're sitting on your computer here and basically you're connected to the cloud and you wanna go out to the cloud and somewhere on the other side, you want to get to that CNN.com server so you can see what's 
whatever is going on in the news today, right? So this is obviously on an entirely different network, and it is important to understand that you do not locally store MAC addresses for an entirely different network. The MAC addresses are for your local area network, essentially whatever is connected to your switch, the switch that you're connected to, or the series of switches that you are connected to. So if we're looking to try to connect to the CNN.com server, and we are an entirely different network, what happens at this point is your computer is going to go up to a DNS server. So there will be a, a DNS server up on the internet. Um, if, you, if you're using your ISP, they'll most likely give you a DNS server to communicate with. Uh, you can use Google's DNS servers, whether it's 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 or 8.8.4.4. .4. There's Cloudflare's DNS servers. Anyways, these are, these are uh, DNS servers that are up on the internet. They resolve things like CNN.com or FoxNews.com. <laughs> <laughs> not, not siding one way or the other here uh, to an IP address. And so basically uh, the DNS server is going to give your computer an IP address of whatever it is, you know, 208.55.66.4, right? This, this is going to be an IP address that is off of your network. And so your computer here is basically going to say, uh, hey, is anybody 208.55.66.4? It's going to realize that this is an entirely different network and so that is then going to go out your router your default gateway right your router separates networks so this is going to go out your router it is going to go into the internet cloud it is going to go through whatever routing or networking equipment is in the internet cloud and then it's going to go over here uh, to the router on the other side or to the network equipment on the other side once it hits the the router on the other side the router as a piece of networking equipment is basically going to say, I'm looking for this particular IP address, right? So this person is looking for this particular IP address. I need a MAC address. I need that media access control address. And so essentially the CNN web server, this web server that hosts CNN.com will say, oh, this is my MAC address. And then the router is going to be able to go through the switch and then send the communication to that web server. That web server gets the communication, gets whatever it is from, that, that you're sending to it, and then it will send a response uh, the other way through. And so this is where the IP addresses are important. So essentially when we're connecting between different networks, we're only going to be using the IP addresses. When we're communicating on the, the local network, that is we're going, where we're going to be using the media access Access control addresses and with that we're using something called address resolution protocol so now that we've talked about a domain name fully qualified domain name resolution to IP addresses and IP address resolution to MAC addresses now let's go back and talk about those old collision domains right when we talk about the Ethernet technology one of the big problems with the Ethernet technology is because it's 50 years old at this point, uh, the basic uh, concept that, that makes it function is, is wonky. <laughs> Is wonky is this is not what you would design in 2022 as we've talked about before right with Ethernet when your different devices try to communicate on an Ethernet network they are going to be using something called collision avoidance collision detection right so on an Ethernet network you have a star topology so a star topology essentially means all of these networking devices are connected together uh, more or less originally just the same way where if you have cable TVs in your house and you have a cable TV splitter, it's, it's basically like that. And back in the old days, it was as stupid as your, 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 your cable splitter. There used to be something called hubs. Do not use a hub in the modern world. And literally all a hub was, was essentially a cable splitter that simply had RJ45 jacks instead of a coax cable connectors to it. But anyways, when a computer wants to communicate with another computer on the network or wants to communicate out through the default gateway so that it can get to the internet, the first thing that it is going to do, it is going to listen to see if anybody else is talking, right? Because everybody is essentially using the exact same line. Uh, if you are old enough to remember landlines, <laughs> which you might not be, 
Oh my God, it's weird. It's weird getting to be middle aged and be like, "Hey, you remember this technology that used to be normal?" Anyways, when you think about the Ethernet technology, it's a lot like landlines in your house. If you remember that, right? If you had a landline in your house, if you had multiple phones, if one person was talking on the phone and then somebody else in the house picked up the phone, they would hear what you were talking about. And if they started talking, the entire conversation was a mess because nobody could figure out what was going on, right? Uh, that, that's basically, you know, how how Ethernet works. It's collision avoidance. Uh, basically, see if anybody else is on the line. Uh, and then there's collision detection. If you talk at the exact same time somebody else talks, uh, then the, there's a collision. There's actually a collision uh, on on the, the networking cable uh, that is detected by the devices that are connected to the networking cable. The devices that are trying to communicate will then wait a random amount of time before they try to communicate again uh, to hopefully make sure they don't they don't have any more collisions. Uh, the problem is being a fish 50 year old technology, you know, just keep banging that one in is uh, this kind of thing worked fine for especially old, slow communication, old, slow computers, where you only had a couple of computers on the network, right? If you have like five computers connected to a hub, maybe 10 computers connected to the hub, and I don't know, you're sending back I don't know, some, some kind of very, very simple emails or whatever else, uh, you're not going to probably run into a lot of problems. Right? There, there may be collisions. Uh, the computers very respectfully wait a random amount of time. Uh, then they try to communicate again, and your communication goes through. Uh, the problem, again, as I've talked about before, is what happens when you go from five computers uh, to 50 computers to 500 computers to 5,000 computers to just an absolute metric ton of computers on your local area network network essentially connected to that hub. Everybody is connected to the exact same wire. So all of a sudden you have more and more computers that are trying to communicate. They they are getting collisions. So then they wait a random amount of time. But because you have so many computers, they all many times wait the exact same random amount of time. And then they try to communicate again and they get more collisions and more collisions and more collisions and more collisions. And, more collisions. and this is what we call a broadcast storm. Basically, the computers are losing their poor little minds because all they're trying to do is communicate with one of the other computers on the network. But there are so many computers that are trying to communicate. It just it just becomes absolutely insane. Right? You see, if you watch videos or whatever uh, of people in a disaster situation and uh, they're all trying to scream over top of each other, that's basically what you get with a broadcast storm. And that's what we got in the world of hubs. Hubs are horrible. I will remind you, if you go to a school and they give you a networking schematic and they say, where does the hub go? The appropriate answer is, where is the trash can in the server room? <clears throat> I actually had an employee where they they told him to, to draw out a schematic with hubs in it. It was very sad. It was a very sad day when I had to tell the employee he was wasting his money on his school. But anyways, right? So hubs don't work. Basically, all hubs are is a splitter. The larger your network is, everything goes to hell. So that's where we have uh, what are called switches. Uh, so what a switch is, switches, switches, is it has all the ports like a hub. So you got ports. You got you know you got eight port hub or eight port switches. You got forty eight port switches. You have core switches that may have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ports. But basically, what the switch does is it learns where what port each computer is connected to and then when somebody tries to communicate to that particular computer instead of sending out data on every single port it simply inside routes the data to that particular port so two computers can basically be having communication on that switch without messing everything up for everybody else how this works at the switch level is the switch identifies all of the different computers based Based off of that MAC address, the media access control address. And so within the switch is something called a MAC table. And so that MAC table basically resolves MAC addresses to port addresses 
on that switch. And so when a computer says, okay, I need to talk to 192.168.1.10, right? You have a computer. If it doesn't know what the MAC address is, this computer is going to say, hey, I need to know who I'm talking to. This communication will go out every single port. One time, essentially, this communication will go out every single port on that switch because he's looking for that MAC, the, the MAC address for 192.168.1.10. The computer that is 192.168.1.10 will respond with its MAC address. So say, hey, I'm, you know, this is this is who I am. I am 192.168.1.10. Here is my MAC address. And then the computer now with address resolution protocol will then using that MAC address say, okay, I need to talk to this MAC address. This goes into the switch. The switch knows, oh, this MAC address is connected to this particular port, and so it will then send the data to that particular port. It is important to understand when you're dealing with the switch, this is a MAC table. So the ARP, uh, the <laughs> ARP address resolution protocol, that is for the devices on the network to resolve IP addresses to MAC addresses. Switches, switches are layer two. Layer two, data link layer in the OSI model, they are below the IP address level. They know nothing about IP addresses. They don't care about IP addresses. All they care about is MAC addresses. So ARP resolves IP addresses to MAC addresses, and then with that MAC address, then the computers are able to communicate with each other at that switch level. So, <sighs> you understand? I hope you understand. I don't want to explain that one again. So, so now our computers have found each other, right? So you have this switch, you know, whatever, the internet or whatever else. You have one computer, it's trying to communicate with the other computer, and they have now found each other. Once they have found each other, we now need to do something called a three-way handshake in TCP. So TCP is called Transmission Control Protocol. When we're talking about TCP IP version four, I swear I'm not trying to make this more complicated. The important thing to understand with TCP IP version four is that it's not actually a single protocol. It is a suite of protocols. So protocols are essentially languages computers use to communicate with each other to do different things. So when we talk about TCP IP4, it's actually, uh, it has two major protocols, TCP uh, protocol and IP protocol. And under that, there's actually a whole mess of other protocols in there, ICMP and things like that. But anyways, right, so, so the IP protocol, that is generally used uh, for the routing purposes. So if you have a router, if you're trying to connect from one network to another network, again, using the IP address, uh, that is where the IP component of TCP IP comes in. The actual communication between the computers is essentially done by TCP, the transmission control protocol. So now that these computers, now that these computers uh, have found each other, so we have computer one here and we have computer two here, now they have to do what is called a three-way handshake. They actually have to open up the, the communication uh, so that they can start communicating. So with this, uh, what happens is the first computer uh, over here basically sends a SYN request, a synchronization request. Uh, and so this is basically saying, hey, Hey, are you there? Are you there? I'd like to talk. That's what the first computer will do to the second computer. The second computer will then send back a SYN acknowledgement, A-C-K. And basically what that is is, yeah, I, I'm fine to start talking. Yeah, you, whenever you want to start talking, I can start talking. And then the first computer then sends back an acknowledgement for that, an ACK. Uh, for that. And so this is the three-way handshake uh, that's used for these two computers to start communicating with each other. One of the things, if you start going on, you start learning about things like cybersecurity, uh, 
an issue that you'll run into is something called a DOS attack or a DDOS attack. Uh, and basically these are denial of service attacks. And one of the attacks that can happen, I don't know how good it is anymore, this used to be a big thing, was something called SIN flooding. Uh, SIN uh, flooding. And what would happen is essentially you would have one computer or many, 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 many computers, and they would start sending these SIN requests to the, the, the target, right? Uh, when the target then did the acknowledgement and essentially K, K, uh, opened a channel to do the communication, the first computer and all the other thousands of computers that were doing this simply wouldn't send the final acknowledgement. So the second computer keeps saying, yeah, I'm ready to talk and waiting and waiting and waiting. And then the, the send flood attack is basically where there's no final acknowledgement done. And then they, they keep sending the send. They keep saying, hey, do you want to synchronize? Yeah, sure. Hey, do you want to synchronize? Yeah, sure. Hey, do you want to synchronize? Hey, sure. Hey, do you want right? They, they keep sending that, 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 that uh, request for communication, but they never finalize request for communication. And at a certain point, all of the, the, the networking resources for the server computer is all tied up Basically, you know, I'm waiting for somebody. Hey, hey, people. Hey, people. I'm here. I'm waiting to communicate. All of you people say you want to talk, but nobody's actually talking. Um, and basically, it creates a denial of service event. Uh, no, no normal user is actually able to be able to communicate with the server or the device uh, that they're trying to communicate with. So this is called the three-way handshake uh, using TCP. Basically, first computer says, hey, do you want to talk? The, the computer is communicating with says, yep, I'm ready for it. And then there is the final acknowledgement. Past that, we then get into what is called TCP windowing. And again, this is one of those things where you look at when you send data, sending the exact same amount of data can take longer or shorter, and it may seem like for very weird reasons. And so basically what TCP windowing is, is uh, whenever you have the two computers, again, you cannot, you cannot send an entire video file. If you have a three gig video file, you don't actually send a three gig video file. That three gig video file uh, gets chopped up into just a whole bunch of chunks or what are called segments. Those segments are then in packets and frames. We'll talk about that in the next section and all of that. Oh, get shipped over uh, to the computer. When this happens, uh, TCP has this ability to do something called windowing, and it's actually dynamic windowing. Uh, so what happens is you have computer one over here. Uh, computer one uh, chops the file into just thousands of little bits, uh, and then basically it starts sending uh, those, those segments, packets, frames, we'll talk about that in a second, uh, over to the computer, the other computer, and the other computer starts rebuilding, right? And so you have a, a segment one, segment two, segment three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to a thousand or a million or whatever else. And all of those have to get sent to the second computer. The second computer then puts all of them back in order. Now, remember uh, when we're talking about this whole networking process uh, that there is something called overhead, right? There, there's headers, there's additional information, and there's a different additional things going on every single time the, the communication is opened between computer one and two. So the computer one, you know, sends, sends sends a segment over, sends an amount of data over, and then computer number two has to send an acknowledgement back before the first computer sends the next chunk over, there's an acknowledgement, so on and so forth. So if you're sending one segment at a time, this process here can really slow everything down. If there has to be an acknowledgement for every little segment, a segment's like 1,500 bytes or something ridiculous, just really, really, really small. If there has to be an acknowledgement for every single one of those segments, uh, it's going to take a lot of time to send files. And so what TCP does with this concept called windowing is basically this is built so that the speed of the data transfer will match the quality of the network that you're dealing with. Right, so if computer number one, right, it's it's chopped up its data into all these segments, it's sending uh, these segments over to computer number two. What it will do is it'll send one, basically one segment over to computer number two. Computer number two will say, "Hey, I received that one segment." 
Okay, that works. So computer number one will say, hey, I'm gonna send two segments over to computer number two. And computer number two will say, yep, I received both segments. And so computer number one will be like, oh, I'll send four segments at one time. So essentially what's happening here is since computer number one knows all of the segments, all of the data is getting to computer number two, it keeps increasing the amount of data it sends every single time because it feels uh, more and more as if the network is reliable. And so it goes to four and then it goes to eight and then it goes to 16 and 32 and 64. It starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all, all of a sudden, and at some point, uh, computer number two will say, oh, I didn't receive all the packets, right? So I was supposed to receive, you know, or segments, I was supposed to receive all of this data and I didn't get as much as possible uh, as I was supposed to. And basically at that point, computer number one will then reset. It'll go back to one and then it'll go back to two, then it'll go back to four, then it'll go back to, to eight and it'll increase again, right? So basically it's this dynamic windowing process where computer number one tries to send as, as much data as it feels it can reliably send when the, the data breaks up for some reason, why, when something gets dropped, it then reduces the speed, then it increases the speed and reduces the speed. Now, when you're dealing with broadband connections, especially fiber optic connections, it's very difficult to actually see this windowing process just in a manual, normal way, unless you have some kind of troubleshooting tools. Uh, if you're older though, and again, you remember landlines, remember those old landlines? Uh, you probably would have remembered this process from when you were downloading files using a dial-up connection. So if you had an old 56k connection uh, remember when you would sit there and they'd have that little download bar and the download bar would go like slow 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 big slow 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 big slow 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 big slow 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 big right that that was this tcp window in process it sent one segment two segments four segments and then it got up to sending i don't know like a thousand segments and then for some reason not all thousand segments got to the other side and so it slowed down again Da, 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 da. And that, that's, that's why on those old dial-up connections, when you were downloading files, you would see it like do a major jump and then do little small jumps and major jump, little small jumps. And that was this dynamic window processing uh, that was going on. So TCP windowing is really cool because it makes sure you get all of your data, right? If you're trying to get a movie file, if you're trying to get a video game file, if you're trying to get something where it's a whole intact file and you wanna make sure that whole intact file gets from point A to point B, TCP and this whole dynamic windowing process is absolutely awesome. But one of the things to, th to think about in the technology world is sometimes, sometimes you need different results. Sometimes getting all of the information is actually not as valuable as getting the information in a timely manner. So when we talk about RTC, so RTC in the tech world is called real-time communication. You can think about this with voice over IP, if you're taking a telephone call, or if you're using FaceTime, uh, if you have some kind of video feed or some kind of streaming feed. Uh, the reality is you don't necessarily want all the data, right? If I'm if I'm talking to to my mom or I'm talking to my wife, I don't necessarily need everything, but I do need it in a timely manner, right? So if I'm sitting there, right? So I'm sitting here and I'm on the phone and I'm talking to my wife and then for some reason there's a problem on the network and essentially you know let's say 30 seconds of my voice gets turned into a little data ball and then gets sent over to my wife all at the exact same time she can't do anything with this right uh, with real-time communication making sure you get all of the data isn't the most important thing. Making sure you get the data in a timely manner is one of the most important things. So you can lose data. Like, so I can I can say, like if I'm talking to my wife and the, the phone breaks up for some reason because there's a networking issue, I would prefer to ask my wife, hey, could you say that again? Versus having the two computers just send 30 seconds of voice blah, 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 all at one time, right? That that doesn't do me any good. So that's where we get something called UDP. So whenever we're dealing with TCP, there's also something called UDP. Uh, you'll most likely see this uh, in your router configurations if you go and me mess around with your router configurations. And essentially with uh, UDP, uh, you, you dump all of the error checking. So uh, most 
most of the error checking that is done with TCP, all of the acknowledgements, all of that kind of stuff, uh, UDP doesn't care about. Essentially what UDP is for is, is for things like real-time communication. When, when data has to go out, it's more important that it gets somewhere timely than that it actually gets there, right? Some, sometimes having failure is okay, right? Again, you gotta prioritize what's important to you. And so with UDP, uh, all of the error checking is gone or most, most of it's gone. And essentially your server or your device is just sending out this data stream. If Packets get lost, they get lost, nobody cares. Again, UDB can be very valuable for real-time communication. Uh, voice over IP, it can be very good for video games. Again, you don't, you don't want, you know, 20 seconds of gameplay just dumped on you. What the hell would you do with it there? Uh, any of these things, like sometimes getting rid of the error checking can be a valuable thing and you can go into your configurations and configure whether you want to use TCP or UDP. So, this can be good. Uh, again, like with networking connection in the United States, I'm not sure at this point in time. Again, because TCP can be fine. If the acknowledgements zip back and forth in a timely manner, it can be fine. The problem is when things break up. Like so back back when we were uh, using like 56K connections sometimes, back when you're using DSL connections, if you have poor networking equipment or poor networking connections, uh, the acknowledgements, there can be a whole bunch of problems with it. Uh, but this may be in like some of the, the, the folks that are that are watching this in, in other countries. And again, some places in Africa, some places in Asia, maybe your networking equipment isn't quite up to speed. And so if you're sitting there and you're doing voice calls and it's, it's bad, like, and you don't understand and why like why is it bad this this should be it's fast enough it should be fast enough for a voice call the latency should be good enough for a voice call but whenever you try to do voice calls <laughs> it's garbage right one of the reasons is you might be using tcp so tcp wants all of these acknowledgements wants to make sure everybody is communicating you know as they're supposed to and so with those acknowledgements that may be what's actually causing a problem for your for your voice over ip or whatever else if you swap over to udp so basically you talk you talk your stream of data gets sent to the other person if packets get lost data gets lost it doesn't matter there's no there's no rebuilding process it just it just gets sent right uh that might work out better for you now one of the other things to be thinking about with networking is sometimes you'll have middle servers that you have to go through um, this isn't as big a deal now thankfully we've gotten past it especially for things like real-time communication uh, but not so long ago many times if you were trying to complete a voice over ip call uh, because of things like firewall rules or how your networking was set up uh, if you were on a network right if you were on a network and somebody else was on a network you couldn't actually just simply communicate with the person on the other network uh, there were basically firewall rules uh, based off of you know who was able to get into the network how it got routed and the whole nine yards and so what used to happen a lot of times is for things like voice over ip is your computer or your voice over ip phone would communicate out to a server that was on the internet their voice over IP phone would then communicate with the same server that was on the internet. And then that server would then basically essentially route the communication between the two parties. Now, to be clear, this type of networking communication for 99% of services is fine, right? If you're trying to download files, who cares if there's a little bit of lag? If you're, if you're watching a YouTube movie, you probably don't care if there's a little bit of lag. Uh, the issue though is in a real time telephone call a voice over IP call the more a lag you you put into that call the more miserable the call is going to be so obviously if computer one can communicate directly with computer two this is going to be the fastest there will be the least lag there will be the least latency and hopefully people be, will be happy when they communicate this way but if you have to communicate up to a server and then they have to communicate up to the server and then the communication essentially has to get connected routed through the server all of a sudden there becomes a question of what does the networking look like where that server is located what is the ip isp connection for that server what are the resources that are available for that server uh, and the whole nine yards and that basically if you're trying to go through another server for something like real-time communication that can make people uh, very miserable um, i saw a major failure of this in the real world uh, so there's a startup company 
uh, that I knew of years ago. Uh, and one of the funny things was is that they were going to be offering voice over IP telephone services using AWS. And again, this was AWS like eight years ago. And I still remember looking at it. I still remember talking to the founder, very serious founder. And I was like, really? Really? You're going to be routing everything through AWS? Isn't the latency and lag going to be horrible? And then about a year later, they were bankrupt. Because <laughs> yes, yes. When you were trying to route real-time communication through AWS's, uh, AWS's cloud infrastructure, that just made a mess for everybody. And so again, this is the kind of thing you need to be thinking about when you build out your infrastructure or if you're trying to troubleshoot things. If you're sitting there, you know, you go, you have good bandwidth, you have good latency, the people you're, you're, you're communicating with, they have good bandwidth, they have good latency. One of the things you might have to start looking at is, oh, okay, you're using a voice over IP server. Where is that voice over IP server? Did somebody decide to put your voice over IP server up on the public cloud? And I guess we haven't talked about public clouds yet. This is so hard. It is so hard to talk to people before we get to definitions. But anyways, right, a voice over IP server is a is this server that is used for your telephone system. Uh, nowadays, it's a server just like any other server. So an Active Directory server, an email server, a voice over IP server. Theoretically, let me say theoretically, you could put a voice over IP server up on the cloud, just like you could put your email server but if you do and the cloud infrastructure it is on, that has its own bugs or quirks, all of a sudden, even though all of your equipment seems to work right, all your local networking and your ISP connection seems to be fine, you may start getting problems because you, know, you put your voice over IP server up on the cloud, which I would not recommend you do. So this is just one of those things to be thinking about with uh, the whole how computers actually communicate with each other. And th this this can be a real big problem. And again, I I saw somebody <laughs> burn through a couple million dollars learning this the hard way. So we're almost at the end. <laughs> Are you as happy as I am? I don't know what it is. There, there is these, some of these subjects in the networking world where it's really not that complicated. Like when you're dealing with this stuff in the real world, I swear to you, it's really simple. It's like, it's a switch. It's a switch. Oh, right? But then when you're trying to explain this to people that don't know everything else, you're just like, it just makes your brain hurt. Look, it makes my brain hurt just trying to explain this stuff. Anywho, the final thing that we then be talking about is, as I've been discussing before, when a computer uh, tries to send uh, information you know, to another computer, uh, basically the file that it has gets subdivided in a whole bunch of different parts, and all of those different parts are what actually get sent to the other computer. When uh, we talk about these parts, the files get divided into, there's something called a frame, there's something called a packet, and there's something called a segment. Uh, so the frame, the frame is the first thing. And essentially, this has the destination MAC address, that media access control address, and the source MAC address. So basically, when when you're sending the data from point A to point B on layer two, the uh, the, the switch layer, uh, it's, this is this is the MAC address that it's going to, and the MAC address that it's from. Within this is a packet. The packet has the IP address. IP address is layer three. This is for routers, right, for different networks. Again, it has a source IP address and it has the destination IP address along with the protocol, most likely gonna be TCP IP four at this point. Then within the packet is the segment. The segment contains the source port, the destination port. We'll talk about this in one of the next classes, um, whenever you're dealing with an IP address, essentially an IP address is kind of sort of like a, uh, a street address. So uh, if you have a hotel or if you have an office building, the office building would be like the IP address. Uh, and then there's a port number. The port number is the equivalent of individual suites within that building. Uh, so you have a FedEx suite and you have a Blockbuster suite and you have a grocery store suite. Uh, and so the port number is is those different suites. So for HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, that generally uses port 80. And so essentially the source port and the destination port uh, along with the data. So the segment actually then contains the data. From here, the computer is able to take that data and recompile it, basically put it into something that you can actually use as a human being, a video file, an email, that type of thing. 
So when we're talking about this, again, it's important to understand when you're sending data through the network, it does not remain one contiguous chunk. You're not, you're not just sending, it's like you're not sending a couch, right? You know, in the physical world, you send a couch, you send a pair of jeans, you send a DVD or whatever. Uh, in the networking world, that couch would get divided into a thousand little bits a frame, a frame is used uh, in the uh, in the layer two world, so on the local area network with the destination MAC address and the source MAC address. So if you're communicating from one network to another, so I'm communicating from my computer to CNN.com, right? The destination MAC address would be the server that has CNN.com on it. The source MAC address would actually be the local router. So the local router uh, has a MAC address too. And so basically the MAC address gets stripped off when you go through the internet, when you go through, go through a router. And so whenever you're looking at the source MAC address, uh, the local network, if it's coming, if the communication is coming in from an external network, the source MAC address will actually be the router that you have on your local network. Uh, then you have the packet, right? The packet is the source IP address and the destination IP address, so the actual IP address that you're going to be trying to go to, along with the protocol, again, TCP IP4, or I guess TCP probably at this point. Uh, that's its own story. Anyways, and then once you get through that, you have what is called the segment the segment then has a source port port 80 port 25 port 443 we'll get into those later the destination port uh, and then that actually has the data itself uh, this kind of thing can get really really tedious and really <laughs> really long after a while, uh, but it's just kind of, it's a good idea to, to have a vague idea how this works. So now you're starting to see all of the additional data that has to be sent uh, whenever you're sending a file, right? Since you can't send one big file, that file gets divided into chunks. Uh, those, you know, those are frames. The frames have packets inside and segments inside. You have all this additional header information, you know, where the data is coming from, where the data is going to, and the whole nine yards. Uh, beyond that, you have the acknowledgments. So when the data is sent, uh, the receiving party has to acknowledge that they actually receive the data uh, and therefore uh, you make sure that the file gets from point A to point B. But all that additional header information that has to be sent, all those additional uh, acknowledgements that have to be sent, that is why uh, sometimes when you're sending data over a network, it's going a lot slower than you may think it should be going. It's like, well, wait a minute, I have this really fast network. Why is this so slow? Some of it may just be the, you know, the acknowledgements and all that kind of stuff going Going on. So one of the things that was created a long time ago for the local area network was something called a jumbo frame, right? So we talked about the frames up there. The frames have the MAC address, uh, destination MAC address, source MAC address, has the packets in there, has the data in there, has all that kind of stuff. One of the interesting things with normal frames, normal frames is that they can only contain uh, 500 bytes of actual data. So the actual data that is being sent, strip out all the headers and everything, each one of those frames can only have 1500 bytes. What, what, what the networking folks realized a long time ago, back in 1999 or whatever, is hey, you know, if we just increased, if we just increased the number of bytes of data that can be sent in each one of these frames, we could actually send a hell of a lot more data without having to, to deal with as many headers and acknowledgements and all that kind of stuff. That is where we get jumbo frames. So frames themselves, uh, these are, were standardized in the uh, IEEE 802.3 standard, and in that standard for Ethernet, it's, it, there's a standard of 1500 bytes. Different manufacturers have come up, different vendors came up with a concept of jumbo frames, and in jumbo frames, they can send up to 9000 bytes, so basically six times as many uh, bytes of data per frame than you can normally. Uh, if your networking equipment supports this, Basically, having your network equipment be able to use jumbo frames versus normal frames is a way to be able to increase the speed of being able to send data across of your across your network in a relatively easy way. Especially now in 2022, we've got good networking equipment. 
you know, we don't we don't lose a lot of data the way that we, we used to. And so it was simply by increasing the size of the payload, uh, you can rapid, you can massively increase uh, the speed of being able to transfer data over your network, decrease uh, resource utilization on your network equipment, and that type of thing. And so when you start to look at how this communication is done, again, with TCP, where you have the three-way handshake, with TCP dynamic windowing, where they say, they, they send they send frames they send packets and then based off of whether or not the the receiver received everything they send more and more and more what you start to see here is how important the actual communication process is of the protocol that you're using, right? UDP is a much better protocol for using real-time communication because it strips out all the error checking, right? If if the receipt, if the, the person that's supposed to receive a packet doesn't receive the packet, it doesn't worry about it, it just keeps receiving whatever is coming in. So again, if I'm having a phone call, the phone call may break up a little bit. I may not hear something that the person on the other side says, but I can just very easily say, hey, can you repeat that? Which is much much better than getting 30 seconds of voice call just dumped on me at all at one time, right? That's an important thing. Again, when we start looking at these packets, we start looking at these frames, we look at how, how the data is actually sent over the network, we can see, oh, wait a minute. So a standard frame is 1500 bytes. So simply by going over to jumbo frames, you can actually send six times as much uh, data, you know, per frame. And so with the acknowledgements and all that, that can actually massively increase uh, the speed of, of being able to transfer things over the network. And so one of the things that you may run into in the real world, and I've seen this, is especially for file protocols. Uh, so when you're sending a file over a network, there's something called file transfer protocol. There's a lot of different protocols out there. One of the interesting things that I've seen uh, to be used internally for businesses uh, for sending files is that some companies will come up with proprietary protocols. Essentially, they will find ways uh, using modern networking to be able to send files a a lot faster than normal, not by you upgrading your networking equipment, but simply by changing how the handshake works, changing how the acknowledgement works, right? So if you have one computer sending data to another computer, um, how, do you, how do you want a failure to work? Uh, how it currently works is you have the one computer sending it to the other computer. If if uh, if if certain packets are dropped, uh, then the first computer has to resend everything that was within that TCP window. Uh, you could do it a different way, where the one computer sends as at everything over to the secondary computer. The second computer can look at at the packets that it's received and said, "Oh, um, okay, I got 99% of the packets, but I need I need packet you know 1333 and I need packet." packet 500 and need packet two, and then the first computer can just send those packets, right? All of that has to be coded. All of that has to be designed. All of that has to be engineered. And so if you're in a real enterprise environment and you're running into problems again with data transfer or anything else, one of the things that you may want to look at is basically, you know, what protocols are you using? Is there a different protocol that you could be using uh, to actually speed up uh, the whole process of data transfer and that type of thing? So there you go. Now you understand uh, the computer address resolution process and the communication process on a network. Or I'm going to imagine that you can understand it. And I'm going to have a couple of beers. Oh, I don't know what it is. I don't. It's so weird. I, I, I swear I swear to you, for any of the noobs out there, I swear to you, at some point, this becomes second nature. At some point, you just walk in, you know what the switch is, you know what the router is, you know what the protocols are, and you just go in, and you do your job, and it's just very easy. The problem that you run into is when you're initially learning this, and when you're trying to teach this, it gets to be very difficult difficult to figure out how to put this into words people understand. I kind of think about this like with martial arts. If you've ever done martial arts, right? Once you become a black belt, you just go in there, ba -da 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 -da, right? You just you just do it. Yeah. But then but then your master, your sensei will be like, oh okay, you're very good. Okay. We have a white belt for you. <laughs> so so now what I need you to do is I need you to teach this white belt how to punch. Right, you're a black belt. You're a black belt. What do you mean punch? Yeah, punch is easy. Oh yeah, punch all day. 
Uh, no, 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 no. You have to teach the white belt how to punt. And all of a sudden you're like, well, well, I mean, you do this, but, but what is this? Right. And you get into this whole, oh, it just, it just hurts. It just hurts. You're like, oh, how do I explain this? I know it. I can do it. But explaining it, that gets to be a bit difficult. So again, if you're a little bit confused right now, it's normal for all of us. And the big issue is there, there are a lot of topics in the computer world. And as I've said, in order to understand one, you have to understand other things you may not actually understand yet. And it gets to be a bit of a mess. Uh, the big takeaways here is just to kind of try to understand how this communication process works the resolution process and then the the uh, the like the three-way handshake and the windowing thing just to have you you have a grasp there uh, again remember the ethernet technology standard was created in 1973 and <laughs> Probably should have come up with a new standard quite a while ago. But just like TCP IP4, we're also probably going to be stuck with it for another couple of decades. So when you look at this and you think it looks stupid, uh, there's a reason. It's a 50-year-old uh, technology standard. But anyways, with the big thing with this, again, remember those collision domains. Uh, essentially, on a local area network, all of your computers, more or less, are connected to the exact same wire. Only one computer can communicate at a time. So they're all listening to see if anybody else is talking. Nobody else is talking. They try to communicate. If two people try to communicate at the same time, uh, there's a collision. That collision is detected. Computers randomly wait an amount of time in order to try to send, uh, send uh, their communication again. Small network, it's fine. Large network, you end up with something called a broadcast storm and everything goes to hell. So we have what's called switches. So with a switch, the, uh, the switch has what is called a MAC address table. That table knows every MAC address, that media access control address, that hard-coded address address on every single uh, networking device, actually every single networking port. It knows which MAC address goes to which port on the switch. And so when two computers on the same network are trying to communicate with each other, they actually use the MAC address for communicating. On the computers, if you're using TCP IP4, the IP address 192.168.1.10 or whatever it is, there is something called ARP. Address Resolution Protocol. Address Resolution Protocol resolves the IP address to the MAC address so that the computer knows what MAC address it's trying to communicate with. Again, DNS. DNS it resolves fully qualified domain names, uh, mail server or CNN.com. It resolves those, something that's human readable, to an IP address. So when you try to go to mail server, your DNS server says mail server is 192.168.1.5. Your computer then communicates out on the network and says, hey, what's the MAC address? We're 192.168.1.5. One of the computers responds and says, this is my MAC address. And then your computer actually communicates through the switch using that MAC address value. Past that, you then get into TCP. Again, TCP is transmission control protocol. This is a Oh, what layer four? So layer three is networking. This would be layer layer four. This is uh, what actually allows the, the computers to then connect to each other. Once they've found each other, there's a three-way handshake. And the first computer sends a synchronization request to the second computer. The second computer sends an acknowledgement to that send request. And then the, the, the first computer sends an acknowledgement to that. And then they're talking. Then they can have communication. During this process, it's something called windowing. When one computer is trying to send data to the other computer, uh, basically, everything gets chopped up into these frames, packet segments. Basically, what frames, I suppose. Uh, everything gets chopped up into frames. Uh, those are then sent. Um, they try to send as many as possible. So they send one. If that gets received, then they send two at a time. Then they send four at a time. Then they send eight at a time. Then they send... 500 at a time. Uh, at some point, if there's a breakdown in the network, uh, the, the, these frames start getting lost. Uh, then basically the second computer will say, hey, I didn't get everything that I was supposed to get that time. And so then the first computer starts with one, two, four, eight up to 500 again, and that's where we get that dynamic windowing process. And again, uh, you would have been able to visually see this back in the whole 56K uh, uh, modem days. I'm not sure in the modern world that you can actually see, even with the progress bars, everything's just so fast nowadays. I'm not sure you would see it the way you would before. Uh, finally, you know, talking about everything getting divided down. 
again, you have a you have a chunk of data. That chunk of data actually gets has to get subdivided so that it can be sent over the network. Uh, with that, you have the the frames. So the frames basically have everything. The most important thing there is the the destination MAC address and the source MAC address. If you're if you're sending or receiving between different networks, the source MAC address actually ends up becoming the router. So the MAC addresses when you're going between or uh, between networks get stripped off. Um, so if you're going from from one network to another network, uh, the, the the internal side of the router on the other network, that will be the source MAC address and the destination MAC address is whatever uh, computer that is trying to communicate with. Um, then you have the packet. The packet is then for the IP addresses, source IP address and destination IP address. And then within that, you have the segment. The segment contains the port number. So port 80, port 25, port 21, port 443. And again, <laughs> again, if you don't understand, don't worry. We'll talk about another class. Um, and the data itself, right? So all, so basically that frame gets sent. Then within, when it gets to the uh, the destination computer, the destination computer is able to, to recompile everything. Um, and, and there you go, there you go. The final thing was the whole idea with jumbo frames. So on a local area network, instead of having a frame that was defined as a 1500 bytes by the IEEE under 802.3, there was a concept of a jumbo frame of, hey, can we send six times as much data per frame? So that means more data is going uh, for each one of these uh, sets of headers and acknowledgements and all that kind of stuff. And that is a way to actually speed up your network. Again, what becomes very interesting, once you get into this deeper and you start learning about things like proprietary protocols, what becomes very curious is how you can actually make networking communication speed up massively simply based off of, you know, things like the, you know, how often acknowledgement has to happen, how much data can be sent at what time, uh, the whole nine yards. So, uh, so there you go. There you go. Oh. My brain hurts. <laughs> My brain hurts. Um, I hope this. I hope this made half a bit of sense to you all. Uh, if it didn't, come back for another class. Uh, I'm gonna keep talking. We're gonna start talking about IP addresses and ports. We're gonna start talking about all these other things. And I swear to you, at some point, at some point, it all starts to congeal in your brain, and you're like, oh, now I get what the hell I guess this guy's talking about. At least that's the theory. <laughs> at least that's the theory. Or, or. You go decide to be a florist. <laughs> at, at one of the points during one of these classes, some of some of you may just look at the may, may look at the screen and go, you know what? You know what? Floral arrangement. Floral arrangement seems like a good idea right now. Anywho, that's what I've got for today. As always, I enjoy teaching this particular class and look forward to seeing you in the next one.